While waiting for the control tower to clear me for takeoff, I glanced out through the cockpit canopy at the German countryside, white and crisp beneath the December moon. Behind me lay the boundary fence of the Royal Air Force Base. Straight ahead was the runway, flanked by twin rows of white lights and frozen banks of snow. Ahead and to my left, the airfield tower stood up like a glowing candle. Inside the tower, I knew all was warmth and merriment, the staff waiting only for my departure before they could close down and head back to the party in the mess hall. Within minutes of my going, the lights would die out, leaving only the beacon light beating out in Morse code the name of the station. C-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. For tonight, there would be no wandering aviators to look down and check their bearings. Tonight was Christmas Eve in 1957, and I was a young pilot trying to get home for the holidays. My watch read 10.15 by the dim blue glow of the control panel. It was warm and snug inside the cockpit. The heating turned up full to prevent the canopy from icing up. It was like a cocoon, small, warm, and safe, shielding me from the bitter cold outside, from the freezing air that can kill a man inside a minute if exposed to it at 600 miles per hour. Charlie does it, Nima. You're clear to take off. The voice of the tower controller in my radio headset snapped me back to alertness. Clear takeoff. Charlie Delta Lima. I eased the throttle forward slowly with my left hand, holding the vampire steady down the center line with the rudder. Behind me, the low whine of the goblin engine rose into a scream. The snub-nosed fighter rolled. The runway lights passed till they were flashing in a continuous blur. As the end of the runway whizzed beneath my feet, I pulled the vampire into a gentle climbing turn, raising the undercarriage as I did so. Charlie Delta Lima, you're leaving my airspace. Change frequency to channel Bravo. Happy Christmas. Over to Bravo, Charlie Delta Lima. Happy Christmas. Strapped to my right thigh was the map with my course charted on it in blue ink. But I did not need it. I knew the details by heart. Turn overhead Selly Airfield onto course 265 degrees. Continue climbing to 27,000 feet. On reaching cruise altitude, maintain course and keep speed at 485 knots. Check in with Channel Bravo, the RAF's North German control frequency, to let them know you're in their airspace. Then, a straight run over the Dutch coast and the North Sea. After 44 minutes flying time, change to channel Foxtrot and call Lake and Heath Control to give you a steer. 14 minutes later, you will be overhead Lake and Heath. After that, follow instructions and they'll bring you down on a radio guided descent. 66 minutes flying time with the descent and landing, and my vampire had enough fuel for over 80 minutes in the air. From Lake and Heath, I knew I could get a lift down to London after midnight. By breakfast time, I'd be in my parents' home in Kent, celebrating Christmas morning with my family. I watched the needle on my heading indicator settle on 265 degrees. The nose was pointing towards the black, freezing vault of the night sky, studded with stars so brilliant they flickered. Below, here and there, a village or small town littered with lights. The carol singers would be out now, knocking on doors and singing Silent Night. 400 miles ahead of me in England, the story would be the same. It was good to be going home.
problem started ten minutes out over the North Sea. And it started so quietly that it was several minutes before I realized I had one at all. I must have been failing to concentrate. My thoughts on my waiting family back home. The first warning I had was when I flicked a glance downward to check my course on the heading indicator. Instead of being rock steady on 265 degrees, the needle was drifting lazily round the clock. I swore a most unseasonal sentiment against the directional gyro and the ground technician who should have checked it. Still, it was not too serious. There was a backup compass, the magnetic kind. When I glanced at it, the needle was swinging widely too. Apparently, something had jarred the case, which isn't uncommon. In any event, I could call up Leakin Heath in a few minutes and they'd give me a GCA, a ground controlled approach, the second by second instructions, a well equipped airfield, and give a pilot to bring him home in the worst of weathers. I glanced at my watch. 34 minutes airborne. Before trying Lakenheath, the correct procedure would be to inform Channel Bravo of my little problem so they could advise Lakenheath that I was on my way without a compass. I pressed the transmit button, but instead of the lively crackle of static and the sharp sound of my voice coming back into my ears, there was a muffled murmur inside my oxygen mask, my own voice speaking and going nowhere. The radio was dead. Fighting down the rising sense of panic that can kill a pilot faster than anything else, I swallowed and slowly counted to ten. Then I switched to channel Foxtrot and tried to raise Lake and Heath. But the steady whistle of my own jet engine behind me was my only answer. It's a very lonely place, the sky. Even more so, the sky on a winter's night. And a single seat jet fighter is a lonely home indeed. But that loneliness is offset by the knowledge that at the touch of a button, the pilot can talk to other human beings who can locate his position to within a few hundred feet and hear his call for help. He's not lost anymore. People begin working to bring him down to the flare-lit runway that means home and life itself. But for that, you must have a working radio. While I was vainly testing my radio channels, my eyes scanned the instrument panel in front of me. The instruments told their own message. It was no coincidence the heading indicator and the radio had failed together. Both worked off the aircraft's electrical circuits. Somewhere beneath my feet, amid the miles of brightly colored wiring that make up the circuits, there had been a main fuse blowout. I took stock of the nature of my situation. The first thing to do in such a case, I remembered my old instructor, Flight Sergeant Norris, telling my class of trainee pilots, is to reduce throttle setting to give maximum flight endurance. We don't want to waste valuable fuel, do we, gentlemen? We might need it later, so we reduce the power. This way we fly a little slower, but we will still stay in the air rather longer, won't we? I eased the throttle back and watched the rev counter. It operates on its own generator, so I hadn't lost that at least. The main instruments in front of a pilot's eyes are six, including the heading indicator. The other five are the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, the vertical speed indicator, the attitude indicator, and the slip indicator. Two of these are electrically operated, and they had gone the same way as my directional gyro. That left me with the three pressure-operated instruments, the airspeed indicator, altimeter, and vertical speed indicator. I knew how fast I was going, how high I was, and if I were either climbing or diving. It is perfectly possible to land an airplane with only these three instruments judging the rest by those old navigational aids, the human eyes. 
perfectly possible, that is, in conditions of brilliant weather, by daylight, and with no clouds in the sky. At night, it is not possible. The only things that show up at night, even on a bright moonlit night, are the lights. These have patterns when seen from the sky. If I could identify the great curving bulge of the Norfolk coastline, I could find Norwich, the only major sprawl of lights set 20 miles inland from the coast. Five miles north of the city was the RAF airfield of Miriam St. George, whose red indicator beacon would be blipping out its Morse code identification signal into the night. There, if they only had the sense to switch on the airfield lights when they heard me screaming overhead, I could land safely. I began to let the vampire down slowly toward the oncoming coast. As the fighters slipped toward Norfolk, the sense of loneliness gripped me tighter and tighter. All those things that had seemed so beautiful as I had climbed away from the airfield in Germany now seemed my worst enemies. The stars were no longer impressive in their brilliance. I thought of their hostility, sparkling in endless sub-zero space. The night sky, its stratospheric temperature fixed night and day alike at an unchanging minus 56 degrees, became in my mind a timeless prison creaking from the cold. Below me lay the worst of them all, the heavy brutality of the North Sea, waiting to swallow me and my plane up and bury us in a black liquid crypt. At 15,000 feet and still diving, I began to realize that a new enemy had entered the field. The light of the moon reflected on a flat and endless sea of white. The East Anglian fog had moved in. Perhaps only a hundred or two hundred feet thick, but enough. Enough to blot out all vision of the ground. Enough to kill me. There was no question of trying to overfly the fog to the west. Without navigational aids or radio, I'd be lost over a strange, unfamiliar country. Also out of the question was turning around and flying back to Holland. I had not the fuel. Relying only on my eyes to guide me, it was a question of landing at Miriam St. George or dying amid the wreckage of my vampire somewhere in the fog-wreathed fens. At 10,000 feet, I pulled out of my dive, increasing power slightly to remain level, using up more of my precious fuel. Still a creature of my training, I recalled again the instructions of Flight Sergeant Norris. When we are totally lost above unbroken clouds, gentlemen, we must consider the necessity of bailing out of our aircraft, must we not? Of course, Flight Sergeant. Unfortunately, the single-seat vampire is notoriously difficult to bail out of. What else? Our first move, therefore, is to turn the aircraft towards the open sea, away from all areas of intense human habitation. The procedures were well worked out. They did not, however, mention that the chances of a pilot bobbing about on a winter's night in the North Sea, supported only by a yellow life jacket, ice encrusting on his lips, eyebrows and ears, his position unknown, were less than one in a hundred of living more than an hour. One last procedure, gentlemen, to be used in cases of extreme emergency. That's better, Flight Sergeant. That's what I'm in now. All aircraft approaching Britain's coast are visible on the radar scanners of our early warning system. Therefore, if we have lost our radio and cannot transmit our emergency, we must try to attract the attention of our radar scanners by adopting an odd form of behavior. We do this by moving out to sea, then flying in small triangles, turning left, left, and left again, each leg of the triangle being of a duration of exactly two minutes flying time. In this way, we hope to attract attention. 
When we have been spotted, the air traffic controller is informed and they divert another aircraft to find us. When discovered by the rescue aircraft, we join formation with him and he brings us down through the cloud or fog to a safe landing. Yes, it was the last attempt to save one's life. I recall the details better now. The rescue aircraft, which would lead you back to a safe landing, was called the Shepherd. I glanced at my watch. 51 minutes airborne. About 30 minutes of fuel remaining. I pulled the vampire into a left-hand turn and began my first leg of the first triangle. Below me, the fog reached back as far as I could see. And ahead towards Norfolk, it was the same. Ten minutes had gone by, nearly two complete triangles. When I had been airborne for 72 minutes, I knew no one would come. The fuel gauge read one-eighth full, ten minutes more flying time. I felt the rage of despair welling up. I began screaming into the dead microphone. You bastards! Why don't you look at your radar screens? Why can't somebody see me? Are you all so damn drunk you can't do your jobs properly? Then the anger subsided. I knew then that I was going to die that night. Strangely, I wasn't even afraid anymore. Just enormously sad. It's a bad thing to die at 20 years of age with so much of your life left unlived. And the worst thing is not the fact of dying, but the fact of all the things never done. I dropped the left wing of the vampire toward the moon to bring the aircraft onto the final leg of the last triangle. Down below the wingtip, against the sheen of the fog bank, a black shadow crossed the whiteness. For a moment, I thought it was my own shadow, but it was another aircraft, low against the fog bank, keeping station with me through my turn, a thousand feet below. I kept the turning wing down to keep it in sight. The other aircraft also kept turning until the two of us had done one complete circle. He was flying slower than me. Only then did I realize why he did not climb to my height to take up station on my wingtip. I eased the throttle back and began to slip down towards him. He kept turning. So did I. At 5,000 feet, I could not reduce power anymore for fear of stalling. I knew I was still going too fast for him. To reduce speed even more, I put out the air brakes. Then he was with me, 100 feet off my wingtip. We straightened out together, rocking as we tried to keep formation. I could make out the shimmer of two propellers whirling through the sky ahead of him. Of course he could not fly at my speed. I was in a jet fighter, he in a piston aircraft of an earlier generation. He held station alongside me for a few seconds, then banked gently to the left. I followed, keeping formation with him, as he was obviously the shepherd sent to bring me down. He had the compass and the radio, not I. From the position of the moon, I knew we were heading back toward the Norfolk coast, and for the first time I could see him well. To my surprise, my shepherd was the de Havilland Mosquito, 
a fighter bomber of World War II vintage. And then I remembered that the meteorological squadron at Gloucester still used mosquitoes, probably the last one still flying, to help in the preparation of weather forecasts. Inside the cockpit of the mosquito, I could make out the muffled head of its pilot and the twin circles of his goggles as he looked out the side window towards me. Carefully, he raised his right hand till I could see it in the window, fingers straight, palm downwards. He jabbed the fingers forward and down, meaning we are going to descend, formate on me. I nodded and quickly brought up my own left hand so he could see it, pointing towards my own control panel with one forefinger, then held up five splayed fingers. Finally, I drew my hand across my throat. By common agreement, this hand signal meant I only have five minutes of fuel remaining before my engine cuts out. I saw the goggled, oxygen-masked head nod in understanding. Then, we were heading downward toward the sheet of fog. I could imagine the stream of instructions coming from the radar hut into the earphones of the man flying beside me. I kept my eyes on him, afraid of losing sight for even an instant, watching his every move. Even as the moon sank, I had to marvel at the beauty of his aircraft. The short nose and bubble cockpit. The long, lean, underslug engine pods, each housing a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, a masterpiece of craftsmanship snarling through the night towards home. Two minutes later, he held up his clenched left fist in the window and opened the fist to display all five fingers against the glass. Please lower your undercarriage. I moved the lever downward and felt the dull thunk as all three wheels locked into place. I caught sight of the nose of the mosquito. It had the letters JK painted on it, large and black probably for call sign Juliet Kilo. He leveled out just above the fog layer, so low that tendrils of candy floss were lashing at our fuse lodges, and we went into a steady circular turn. I glanced at my fuel gauge. It was on zero, flickering feebly. For God's sake, hurry up! A sweat broke out behind my neck and began to run in streams down my back. Hurry up, man. Hurry, hurry! I saw his left hand flash the dive signal to me. Then he dipped towards the fog bank. I followed, and we were in it. The visibility was down to near zero. No shape, no size, no form, no substance. Except that off my left wingtip, now only 40 feet away, was the mosquito flying with absolute certainty towards something I could not see. Only then did I realize he was flying without lights. For a second I was amazed, horrified by my discovery. Then I realized the wisdom of the man. Lights in fog are treacherous, hallucinatory, mesmeric. You can be attracted to them, not knowing whether they are 40 or 100 feet away from you. The tendency is to move toward them. For two aircraft in the fog, flying in formation, that could easily spell disaster. Without warning, the shepherd pointed his index finger at me, then forward through his windscreen. It meant, there you are, fly straight ahead, and land. I stared forward through the windshield. Nothing. Blackness. Then, yes, something! White lights, the runway. Frantically, I reduced the power and held her steady, praying for the vampire to settle. She was down. The main wheels had stuck and held. 
Both of my hands were clenched tightly with white knuckles around the control column. I forget now how many seconds I held my breath before I could believe I was still alive. There was no need to turn off the engine. It had finally run out of fuel as the vampire careened down the runway. I slowly began to unstrap myself from my seat and parachute. As I did so, a movement caught my eye. To my left, through the fog, no more than 50 feet off the deck, the mosquito roared past me. I caught the flash of the pilot's hand in the side window, and then he was gone up into the fog before he could see my answering wave of acknowledgement. I had already decided I would call up Gloucester to thank him personally. I released the canopy and pushed it upward and backward. I expected the control tower truck to be alongside within seconds of my landing. For with an emergency landing, even on Christmas Eve, a fire truck, ambulance, and half a dozen other vehicles were always on standby. Nothing happened. Not for at least 10 minutes. Then, two headlights came dropping out of the mist and stopped 20 feet away. A voice called out. Hello there! I stepped out of the cockpit, jumped from the wing to the ground, and ran towards the lights. It turned out to be the headlights of a battered old civilian car, not an RAF marking in sight. At the wheel of the car was a puffed, beard-faced man with a handlebar mustache and the smell of whiskey on his breath. Is that yours? Yes. I just landed it. Extraordinary. Quite extraordinary. You better jump in. I'll run you back to the mess. I was grateful for the warmth of the car. Even more so to be alive. As we moved away from the vampire, I saw that I had stopped just 20 feet short of a plowed field at the very end of the runway. You're damn lucky. Damn lucky indeed. I ran out of fuel just as I was landing. My radio and all the electrical systems failed nearly 50 minutes ago, out there over the North Sea. No compass? No compass. I flew in the approximate direction by the light of the moon. No radio? Just a dead box on all channels. Then how did you find this place? Why, I was guided in. I flew short left-hand triangles as per the instructions, and the radar station sent up a Shepard aircraft to bring me down. Damn lucky, all the same. I'm surprised your shepherd managed to find this place. It was one of the weather aircraft from RAF Gloucester. Obviously, he had a radio, so we came here in formation on a GCA. Then, when I saw the lights of the runway, I landed myself. Extraordinary. You said you came in on GCA. We don't have GCA. We don't have any navigation equipment at all. Not even a beak. Wait... This isn't RAF Miriam St. George? No. This is RAF Minton. Minton? I've never heard of it. I'm not surprised. We're not an operational airbase. Haven't been since the war. Minton's a storage depot now. He stopped the car and got out. I saw we were standing a few feet from the dim shape of a control tower adjoining a long row of buildings evidently once flight rooms and briefing huts. Above the door at the base of the control tower through which the officer disappeared hung a single flickering light bulb. I could make out broken windows and padlocked doors. The place had an air of abandonment and neglect. The man returned and climbed shakily back behind the wheel. 
Just turning the runway lights off. Why did you switch them on? Why? It was the sound of your engine. I was in the officer's mess, having a nog, and old Joe suggested I listened out the window for a second. There you were, flying right above us. You sounded damn low, almost as if you wanted to come down in a hurry. Thought I might be of some use, remembering they never disconnected the old runway lights when they dismantled the station. So I ran down to the control tower and switched them on. I see. That's why I was so late coming to pick you up. I had to go back to the mess to get the car after I heard you land. Then I had to find you. Bloody foggy night. Where is RAF Minton, exactly? Five miles from the coast. And where's the nearest operational RAF station with all the radio navigational aids, including ground-controlled approach? Hmm. Must be Miriam St. George, I reckon. Mind you, I don't know much about all that. I'm just a stores, Johnny. So that was the explanation. My shepherd in the weather plane had been leading me straight in from the coast to Miriam St. George. By chance, abandoned old storage depot Minton lay right along the flight path to Miriam's runway ten miles ahead. Then this old fool had switched on his lights. Coming in on the last ten mile stretch, I had plucked my vampire down at the wrong airfield. I was about to lecture the man about interfering with modern procedures that he couldn't possibly understand when I choked the words back. My fuel had run out halfway down the runway. I'd never have made it to Miriam ten miles away. I'd have crashed in a field short of touchdown. We reached the officer's mess and went in. The place had seen better days. Only a few cracked leather club chairs occupied the room, which could have easily fit 50. My host, who told me his name was Flight Lieutenant Marks, shrugged off a sheepskin coat and threw it over a chair. I'm sorry it's not very hospitable, old boy. Not to worry, but I could do with a bath and a meal. I think we can manage that. I'll get Joe to fix up a spare room. God knows we have enough of them. He'll also cook up a meal. Bacon and eggs do? That'll do just fine. While I'm waiting, do you mind if I use your phone? Of course. He ushered me into the mess secretary's office. It was small and cold, but it had a chair, an empty desk, and a telephone. My watch told me it was close to midnight. Hell of a way to spend Christmas, I thought. Then I recalled how thirty minutes earlier I had been crying for help, and I felt ashamed. I picked up the phone and dialed the number for Miriam St. George. Miriam St. George, how may I direct your call? Air traffic control, please. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid there's no flying tonight, sir. No one is working at air traffic control. Then give me the station duty officer, please. Right away, sir. When I got through to her... I explained about the emergency and that her station had been alerted to receive a vampire fighter coming in without radio on a ground-controlled approach. She listened attentively. She was quite sober, as a station duty officer is supposed to be at all times, even on Christmas Eve. I don't know about that. I don't think we've been operational since we closed down at 1700 hours this afternoon. Where are you speaking from? RAF Minton. I've just made an emergency landing here. No, it's not that. I don't mind being here. It's just that I landed at the wrong airfield. I thought I was heading to your airbase on a ground-controlled approach. Well, make up your mind. Were you or weren't you? You ought to know. I was intercepted by the weather plane from Gloucester, and he guided me in. But in this fog, it must have been on a GCA. No other way to get down. When I saw the lights of Minton, I landed here assuming it was Miriam St. George. I'm ringing to alert you to stand down your radar and air traffic control crews. They must be waiting for a vampire that's never going to arrive. It already has arrived. Only here, at Minton. We've been closed down since 1700. There has been no call from us to turn up. But Miriam St. George has a GCA. I know we do, but it hasn't been used tonight. Good night to you. Happy Christmas. I leave.
leaned back and breathed deeply. On the fuel I was carrying, not only could I not have made Miriam St. George, but it wasn't even open. It began to dawn on me that I didn't really owe my life to the shepherd pilot from Gloucester, but rather to Flight Lieutenant Marks. Bumbling, old, drunk Flight Lieutenant Marks, who couldn't tell one end of an aircraft from the other, but had run 400 yards through the fog and snow to switch on the runway lights of an abandoned old airfield because he heard a jet engine circling overhead too close to the ground. Still, that mosquito must be back at Gloucester by now, and he ought to know that despite everything, I was alive. I rang the operator. Gloucester? At this time of night? Yes, Gloucester. Even at this time of night. The duty meteorologist took the call, and I once again explained the situation. I'm afraid there must be some mistake, flying officer. It couldn't have been one of ours. Look, this is RAF Gloucester, right? Yes, it is. Right. And your unit flies mosquitoes? No. We used to fly mosquitoes, but they went out of service three months ago. Now we use cameras. The mosquitoes were sent to museums, I think. Or scrapped, most likely. Could one of them have been sold privately? Hmm, I suppose it's possible. Uh, it's to depend on air mystery policy, but I think they were scrapped. Thank you. Thank you very much. And happy Christmas. I put the phone down and shook my head in bewilderment. What a night. What an incredible night. First, I lose my radio and my heading indicator. Then I get lost and short of fuel. Then I'm taken in by some moonlighting harebrain with a passion for vintage aircraft flying his privately owned mosquito through the night, who happens to spot me, and finally a half-drunk ground duty officer has the sense to put his runway lights on in time to save me. Luck doesn't come in much bigger slices. But one thing was certain. Without that amateur air ace, my frozen corpse would be bobbing around in the North Sea right now. Your room is ready. Uh, number 17, just down the corridor. Joe is making up a fire for you now, and bad water is heating. If you don't mind, I think I'll turn in. Will you be all right on your own? Yes, I'll be fine. Many thanks for all your help. I wandered down the corridor. From the doorway of room 17, a bar of light shone into the passage. As I entered the room, an old man rose from his knees in front of the fireplace. Good evening, sir. I'm Joe, sir, the mess steward. Yes, right, Joe. Mr. Marks told me about you. Sorry to cause you so much trouble at this hour of the night. I just dropped in, as you might say. Yes, Mr. Marks told me. I'll have your room ready shortly, as soon as this fire burns up. It'll get quite cosy. I began eating the sizzling bacon and eggs. The old steward stayed to talk. You've been here long, Joe. Oh, yes, sir. Nigh on twenty years now. Since just before the war, when the station first opened. You've seen some changes, eh? Surely it wasn't always like this. Ah, that it wasn't, sir. That it wasn't. He told me of the days when the rooms were crammed with eager young pilots. The bar roaring with songs, the months and years when the sky above the airfield crackled and snarled with the sound of piston engines driving planes off to war and bringing them back again. After finishing the food, I rose from the table, fished a cigarette from the pocket of my flying suit, lit it, and sauntered round the room. The steward began to tidy up the plates and glasses from the table. I halted before an old photograph in a frame standing alone on the mantel above the crackling fire. I froze with my cigarette half raised to my lips, feeling the room go suddenly cold. The photo was old and stained, but still clear enough. It showed a young man in his early twenties, dressed in flying gear. He wore thick, sheepskin-lined boots, rough serge trousers, 
and a heavy leather jacket. From his left hand dangled one of the soft leather flying helmets they used to wear with goggles attached instead of the modern pilot's tinted visor. He stood with legs apart, right hand on hip, a defiant stance. But he was not smiling. There was something sad about his eyes. Behind him stood his aircraft. There was no mistaking the lean, sleek silhouette of the Mosquito fighter bomber. I was about to say something to Joe when I felt a gust of cold wind on my back. One of the windows had blown open and the icy air was rushing in. I'll close that, sir. No, no. I'll get it. It took me two strides to cross to where the window swung on its steel frame. To get a better hold, I stepped inside the curtain and stared out. Somewhere far away in the fog, I thought I heard the snarl of aircraft engines. But it was probably just a motorcycle of some farm boy taking leave of his sweetheart. I closed the window and turned back into the room. I nodded toward the lonely photograph on the mantel. Who's the pilot, Joe? The pilot, sir? Oh, that's a photo of Johnny Kavanagh. He was here during the war, sir. Kavanagh? Yes, sir, an Irish gentleman. A very fine man, if I may say so. As a matter of fact, sir, this was his room. What squadron was that, Joe? Pathfinders, sir. Mosquitoes, they flew. Remarkable pilots, all of them. But I venture Mr. Johnny was the best of them all. But then again, I'm biased, sir. I was his orderly, you see. I studied the picture closely. There was no doubting it. The faint letters on the nose of the mosquito behind the figure in the photo read J.K. Not for call sign Juliet Kilo, but for Johnny Kavanaugh. The whole thing came to me clear as day now. Kavanaugh had been a crack pilot flying with one of the elite Pathfinder squadrons. After the war, he'd left the Air Force, made a pile of money, bought an old mosquito in one of the periodic auctions of obsolescent aircraft, refitted it, and flew it privately whenever he wished. Not a bad way to indulge your passion for flying if you had the money. So he'd been on his way back from some trip to Europe, spotted me turning in triangles above the fog bank, realized I was lost, and took me in tow. Knowing this stretch of the coast by the back of his hand, he'd taken a chance on finding his old wartime airfield at Minton, even in the thick fog. It was a hell of a risk. I had no doubt I could trace the man, probably through the Royal Aero Club. He was certainly a good pilot. Oh, the very best, sir. They reckon he had eyes like a cat, did Mr. Johnny. I recall many a time his squadron would return from dropping flares on targets for heavy four-engine bombers. The rest of the young gentlemen would go into the bar for a drink, or more likely several drinks. But not my Johnny. He'd have his mosquito refueled and take off again to see if he could find some lone bomber making for the coast and guide it home. Of course, some of them would have taken lots of enemy fire and had their radios knocked out. That was a bit before your time, if you'll part of my saying so, sir. I've seen pictures of them. And he used to guide them back. I could imagine them in my mind's eye. Lancasters and Halifaxes, gaping holes in their bodies, wings and tails creaking and swaying as the pilots sought to hold them steady for home, a wounded or dying crew, and the radio shot to bits. I knew from too recent experience the bitter loneliness of the winter sky at night with no radio, no guide for home, and the fog blotting out the land. Quite a man, I said, and I meant it. Even today, years after the war, he was still a superb flyer. Oh, yes, sir. Quite a man, Mr. Johnny. It guided them home all right, back here to Minton, sometimes through fog so dense you couldn't see your own hand in front of your face. Six cents, they said he had. I remember him saying to me once, standing right there where you are now, Joe, he said, whenever there's one of them out there in the night, crippled and trying to get back, I'll go out and bring him home. Well, by the look of it, He's still doing it. 
Oh, I hardly think so, sir. Mr. Johnny went out on his last patrol on Christmas Eve, 1943. Exactly 14 years ago tonight. He never came back. He went down with his plane somewhere out there in the North Sea. Good night, sir. And happy Christmas. <laughs>